My name is Allison Ledley, and this video is entitled Ableism and Diversities, The Disabled Body, Actor Training, and Futures of Inclusion. I am currently a doctoral candidate at the University of Toronto at the Center for Drama, Theatre, and Performance Studies, where my research is focused on contemporary theatrical representations of disability and the freak show. My research is largely influenced by my own experiences living with a chronic disease. According to a 2012 Statistics Canada survey, nearly 14%, 3.8 million Canadians between the ages of 15 and 65 self-identify as disabled. These statistics reflect the claims of numerous disability study scholars and self-identified members of the disability community that disability is in no way a unique or limited experience. And yet, as scholars like Petra Cuppers, Carrie Sandell, and Rosemary Garland Thompson have noted, within contemporary popular and visual culture, including our nation's theaters, disabled subjects and narratives of disabled subjectivity are often drastically underrepresented or misrepresented. For example, the freak show, the most popular form of entertainment on North American stages for nearly a century, reduced the disabled body to a sight of spectacle. Many texts diminished the disabled subject to tropes of pity and charity, such as Laura Wingfield from Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie, or utilized the body's physical anomalies as a visual signifier of evil and monstrosity, as in Shakespeare's eponymous Richard III. However, Recent works from across Canada reflect a movement towards both a more inclusive performance theatrical practice and more nuanced representations of disabled subjectivity on our nation's stages. These include productions such as Judith Thompson's most recent collective creations, Rare, based off of the experiences of nine Toronto-based actors who happen to all have Down syndrome, and Born, another collective creation, this time detailing the experiences of nine Ontario residents who are all wheelchair users. Julie Devaney's one-woman show, My Leaky Body, in which Devaney chronicles her experiences navigating our nation's healthcare system after a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Or finally, the work of Vancouver's Theatre Terrific, a company that champions inclusive theatrical practice and performance. Within the context of this video, when we speak of disability, it is to be understood that we are speaking of a complex and nuanced mode of self-identification. Historically speaking, Disability is typically considered to be a direct result of impairment, a term that refers to the loss or difference in psychological and physiological bodily function. For many years, the so-called medical or clinical model of disability focused on erasing or negating impairment through medical research and practice. However, since the 1970s, many disability study scholars and now major governmental organizations such as the World Health Organization recognize the role of social, cultural, historical, and political assumptions, values, and attitudes that, according to the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, quote, disabled physically impaired people, end quote. Thus, the so-called social model defines disability not within the material body, but within built environments that limit access to those who use assistive devices or within ableist modes of thinking, which are often insidious and implicit, that negate or subjugate the disabled subject. Today, many disability activists and scholars utilize what is known as a theory of complex embodiment in defining disability. Within this newer theoretical framework, such social, cultural, and historical factors, such as questions of accessibility or negative attitudes around disability, are considered in tandem with the phenomenological experience of the subject, or, to offer a brief sketch of a complicated philosophy, the experience of our body as it interacts with its environment and surroundings. Where the social model once disregarded the material body, this newer model takes into account issues of physical impairment, the aging body, fatigue, and chronic pain associated with the material body. As a result, this newer model embraces narratives and experiences that have typically been excluded from earlier conceptualizations of disabled subjectivity. Unlike the medical model of disability, these newer conceptualizations of disability open up lines of inquiry and investigation around the historical and cultural processes that inscribe the body as disabled or ill, and also bring the notion of the healthy or able body as a biological absolute under question. This line of thinking is intimately linked to identity politics, wherein the question of biology versus the performative is raised in discussions of gender, race, and sexuality. 
Both performance studies and disability studies scholars, such as Bruce Henderson and Noam Ostrander, and Philip Ostrander and Carrie Santel, have noted this link and utilized the work of canonical texts from within the field of performativity and performance studies, as well as the neighboring fields of critical race theory, gender studies, and queer studies, as an entryway into theorizing about the ways in which anomalous or extraordinary bodies are embedded with meaning. Salient texts related to the performative underpinnings of identity utilized in disability research include Irving Goffman's The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, Judith Butler's Gender Trouble, and J.L. Austin's theory of speech acts. Considering the intimate theoretical links between performativity, performance studies, and disability theory, it should come as no surprise that theater and performance has emerged as a valuable framework in which to explore disabled subjectivity and identity. In addition, scholars invested in disability arts culture have also philosophized on the theater's numerous other qualities that make the stage a potential site of political and cultural intervention. These include the role of the arts in fostering community, the role of theatrical play and imagination as an educational tool, and the agency that is afforded to the subject in theatrical self-representation. While the theater has emerged as an advantageous site of cultural intervention for self-identified disabled theater artists and performers, it is important to review the ways in which theater, both the physical space and the artistic practice, has, historically speaking, been a cultural site which implicitly reinforces the cultural superiority of the able or normal body. As previously stated, playwrights from Shakespeare to Tennessee Williams have utilized disability, or rather, the visible differences of the anomalous physical body as a metaphor or literary trope, thereby reducing and negating the disabled subject to little more than a narrative device. Furthermore, contemporary depictions of characters with disability are limited. For example, characters with disabilities on primetime networks make up less than 1% of all scripted characters on primetime television. Moreover, these comparably limited roles are overwhelmingly portrayed by able-bodied actors in a process that is referred to as cripping up. Some examples that you may be familiar with include Daniel Day-Lewis's Oscar-winning interpretation of Christy Brown, who was born with cerebral palsy in My Left Foot, or Kevin McHale, an able-bodied actor portraying Artie Abrams, who happens to be a wheelchair user, on the popular television show Glee. Many critics of this common casting practice draw parallels to such anachronistic and problematic performance traditions like blackface and minstrelsy, borrowing from the term blacking up, and point to its role in reduced employment for actors with disabilities and the lack of diverse casting on stage and screen. Indeed, Please consult Nalia's videos in this series to help elucidate the similar complexities faced when representing other than white bodies in text and on stage. Ableism within the Canadian theatre community also extends to the physical theatre stages and theatre houses. Many theatre stages across Canada, including many theatres in Ontario, were not built to be accessible spaces. Indeed, many traditional proscenium stages do not include accessibility ramps in the backstage area, and quite often, Backstage passageways are too narrow to accommodate assistive mobility devices, and sound and lighting equipment are only accessible via ladders and narrow catwalks. Such questions around access, or rather, inaccessibility, can also be located within the rehearsal hall. Issues can include physical warm-ups and games that assume a so-called normal sense of bodily space perception, ignoring those individuals who may use assistive devices, have orthopedic disabilities, or individuals with differing body schemas. The body-centric acting techniques that are predicated on the assumption that the actor's body is an able body, or traditional tech-centered approach to theater creation that require actors to memorize significant amounts of new text, a task that can be difficult for an actor with a diagnosis of dyslexia or cognitive impairment. As theater scholars and artists looking for a more inclusive mode of performance practice and pedagogy, an exploration of the aesthetic, artistic, and dramaturgical techniques utilized by artists and practitioners working within the disability theater community can offer useful, practical examples in how we can look towards such a practice. As Kirstie Johnston notes in her respective exploration of Canadian disability theater, much like disability itself, there is no singular ideology, aesthetic, or dramaturgy that predicates disability theater or disability culture. Instead, 
Disability culture and disability theater are united by their overriding goal to dismantle ableist culture and challenge the dominant social norms that inscribe the anomalous body as culturally inferior. One tactic that is utilized within the disability theater community is increasing the visibility of physically anomalous or extraordinary bodies on stage through more diverse casting, a desire that is shared with actors with disabilities working in the broader cultural community, and generating more theatrical roles for persons with disability that transcend the stereotypical representation and tropes of disabled subjectivity that have dominated the theatrical landscape. For example, in Theater Terrific's The Glass Box, narratives of sexuality, desire, and fantasy are ascribed to a number of bodies across a spectrum of abilities and experiences. This production is in sharp contrast to many representations of disability and sexuality in mainstream culture that assumes that the disabled subject is asexual or undesirable. Furthermore, as disability culture typically tends to push back against the dominant social structures and hierarchies that inscribe the disabled body as inferior, Another common technique is to eschew the traditional top-down theater model in favor of collective and collaborative models of creation or alternative modes of theatrical production, such as body and performance art. It is worth noting that such collective endeavors, indeed disability theater in general, can include groups of mixed abilities, as with Theater Terrific or Calgary's Momo Dance Company. Certainly, Seeking to include a spectrum of bodies and physical abilities, especially in artistic modes such as dance that is considered to be physically demanding and requires a great deal of athleticism, reframes what constitutes dance, eloquence, athleticism, and movement, and by extension, introduces new modes of bodily engagement, such as those related to movement and breath, to the stage that would otherwise remain underexplored and underutilized. In addition, Many works also seek to make explicit the implicit cultural processes that inscribe the disabled body as othered to reframe the power dynamics between the disabled subject and observer. For example, playwright and performer Matt Fraser often embodies the role of the freak in his performances wherein he appropriates the gaze, a concept that emerged from feminist psychoanalytic theory and is aligned with a form of looking in which those subjected to the stare are fetishized and objectified. The effect of this technique is that he is able to not only destabilize the assumed power dynamics between the disabled subject and observer to reclaim agency, but in doing so, he also gestures to the very processes that are implicit to the construction of disability. These aesthetic and dramaturgical techniques are demonstrative of the so-called quote-unquote aesthetics of access and reflect some of the ways in which accessibility can be included within theatrical practice from the rehearsal hall to closing night. Moreover, Considering the multifaceted nature of disabled identity, and by extension, the interdisciplinary nature of disability studies, such techniques are in no way limited to theatrical representations of disability. Indeed, such techniques are seen within traditions such as feminist body art and queer performance, and underscore the complex nature of disability culture and subjectivity. This video is intended to act as a catalyst to broader discussions in the classroom and rehearsal hall that surround the theoretical intersections between disability identity and performance theory. And having begun to unpack the complex notion of disability, this work also seeks to assist theater practitioners in identifying where ableist thinking can and had infiltrated theater pedagogy and performance practice and the ways in which self-identified disabled theater artists and allies have simultaneously utilized the stage as a means of pushing against such ableist practices through the aesthetics of accessibility. It is my hope that through this introduction to disability theater and disability performance practice, new lines of artistic exploration, innovation, and practice are opened up to you, the viewer, as a means of not only looking towards a more inclusive mode of artistic practice, but also to reframe conventional notions of what constitutes the body and the body's potential, including movement, breath, and sound within performance. For additional sources, questions for class discussion, and more videos from the Diversities in Acting Training in Canada series, please browse the rest of this website.